Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest has written one of the most shocking books of deceit and trauma that I've ever read. Knowing that she was adopted, she began searching at the age of 18 for her birth family. What should have been a simple process to access her adoption records turned into a gut-wrenching 30-year investigation and ordeal because she discovered that she had been sold as a newborn baby in McKaysville, Georgia, by the town's local doctor, Thomas Hicks, who had built up a lucrative business of selling babies. Sometimes the mothers were in trouble and willingly gave their babies away, and sometimes the doctor lied to the mothers, told them their babies had died, and then sold them to desperate couples who couldn't have children of their own. Over 200 babies were illegally sold or given away by Dr. Hicks in the 50s and 60s. In 1997, our guest broke this story to the media, which launched a deluge of birth mothers and illegally adopted children searching for the truth. In 2019, the TLC television channel produced a three-part documentary series called Taken at Birth about this story. And last year, our guest released her book entitled Taken at Birth, Stolen Babies, Hidden Lies, and My Journey to Finding Home. I'm very pleased to welcome Jane Blasio to our show. Jane, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Jane, you and your sister Michelle were both illegally obtained from Dr. Hicks four years apart. And you found out when you were six years old when the kids at the local playground made fun of you and your sister by calling you black market babies, do you think your parents had any intention of telling you the truth about where you came from? Oh, absolutely not. My father even said more, more times than, than one, he said it over and over, that they didn't plan on telling us. They didn't plan on telling us that we were adopted, not, yet alone where he got us from, that he had paid cash for us. Your adoptive mother died when you were 22, and her last words to you were, I'm sorry. What do you think she was trying to tell you? You know, it, there are a lot of things that were wrapped up in that, I'm sorry. One was that she wasn't more articulate. She didn't talk about it. She hushed it down and didn't talk. And kind of, when you're growing up, you need to know things and you need to be nurtured. And she didn't nurture through that whole adoption process and when we're the, you know, the answers of where they got us from, she just, she just tried to stay away from it more than anything. And I think it was that, and that the way the adoption took place, we had no medical information. We had no historical information. You know, where do we come from? You know, where do we get what we look like? And I think it was all wrapped up in that. I'm sorry. But you wrote that she never showed you any affection and never told you she loved you. No, she didn't. That was, uh, you know, you know, I think it was generational in a way as well. My grandmother, her mother was very stoic herself and had had a very rough upbringing. And, you know, so my mother had made so many mistakes. I mean, she literally went through her life thinking that she wasn't good enough for anything. And she most certainly wasn't prepared for someone like me, you know, my sister, Michelle was all smiles and I was all questions, you know, I was all, you know, what's this, what's that, you know, where Michelle was like, sure, no problem. But I questioned everything. And I think that was part of it too. You know, she just didn't know how to deal with me. She was very quiet. Your adoptive father, James Walters, who died in 1995, did give you some information about where you came from, correct? Yes, he did. He did. So, I mean, he started with little, you know, bits, you know, I, I started looking at the birth certificate when I was in my teens, when I first got my hands on it, about 14 years old. And I said, what's the Hicks clinic? And he said, well, it's this place in Georgia. That's where we got you from. And he would give us information like that. But if I didn't ask pointed questions, you know, he would say a little bit and then that would be it. And so it just, so my mother passed and I think out of respect for her, he was trying to keep everything as quiet as possible. And then, you know, myself, I did the same thing. You know, she was going through cancer from the time I was 18. And so I didn't want to upset her. We were, we were more focused on being there to support her and hoping that she would live. And we weren't, I wasn't thinking when I was sitting next to her, you know, about my information as much as I was 
you know, how much longer do we have, you know, with her? So it, it had a lid put on it several times throughout my life, but. But what your dad did tell you is that Dr. Hicks handed you to your parents through a car window and you hadn't even been cleaned up after the birth. Yes. So when they got me, I still had the dried blood and, and mucus on me. They weren't sure that they were going to make it home with me with a live baby because I was so small. They said I was just an absolute mess. I didn't look healthy. My mom was afraid. And my dad had said we were afraid. You know, how, do, how do you explain you know, to a hospital or a police department? What do you do with a dead baby? And how do you explain it when the mother supposedly has never, I mean, it wouldn't take much to examine her to know she hadn't been pregnant. And so he knew he couldn't go back to Dr. Hicks. So yeah, so it was out the back door and try to make the best of it is basically what that, what that transaction was. Well, now just to give our viewers a sense of who Dr. Hicks was, in the 1940s, he went to jail and lost his license in Tennessee for selling drugs to the local miners. But after his release from jail, the people of McKaysville, Georgia, took him in and allowed him to practice medicine. He conducted abortions and ran his illegal baby selling business right under the nose of the local authorities and the community who turned a blind eye to him. And his employees kept his secrets as well. Eventually, a woman upon whom he had conducted an abortion against her will reported him to the police and he was convicted. He died in 1972. Jane, my question to you is this. Why do you think it took so long for someone to report Dr. Hicks to the authorities? You know, it's a small town in North Georgia back in. I mean, he arrived there, you know, in the early 1900s once he got his medical degree from Emory University in Atlanta. It was a different time. It was a place that women had no, they had no say in anything. They, they had no power whatsoever to be able to fight back to this. So, I mean, the, he was better known for his abortions than his adoptions. I mean, that right there says a lot. You know, it, women did not have a choice. And the law enforcement looked the other way. The mayor looked the other way. You know, the, the officials looked the other way. Some he helped because of their, uh, their affairs and they needed to, you know, find a way to get rid of a baby very, you know, very quickly. So he helped them. So it was patting each other on the back and the uh, proverbial, you know, good old boys club. Now you met Dr. Hicks' daughter, Margaret, who wasn't very helpful at all, was she? No, she didn't give me any direct information, but I'll tell you what she did help me with. And that was, she confirmed some stuff that I knew. And I would say, you know, I would call her and say, I heard this, is this true? And she would say, yes, it is. And, but she also had helped me to, to be able to reach out and touch, get, be in touch with her. Meeting with Margaret and having communications with Margaret helped me in my investigation because I felt like she was that link to Dr. Hicks. And I needed to know who he was and how he did his business to find out who I was. So she she was also apologized to you on behalf of her father, didn't she? She apologized. She said she was sorry as well, but she didn't specify for what. But, you know, again, you know, uh, I've got this, I'm sorry. You know, it's a, a veiled attempt at making up for looking away. You even met a woman by the name of Winnie Payne who had worked for Dr. Hicks. She didn't give you any detail either. She simply said, I did what I had to do. That must have been so frustrating, Jane. You know, it was frustrating, but the more I absorbed what she was saying, the more I felt bad for her. You know, it's, it's one thing to know about it in retrospect. It's one thing for me to go back and say he was, you know, selling these babies. He was selling me. But man, to be there and not be able to do anything, even if you knew right from wrong and you felt you could, because here was just another woman. Here was just another poor person in the eyes of a rich person that couldn't do anything to him. And the regret that she must have had 
and the frustration that she must have had, I think was probably probably more than mine has ever been. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details of your investigation because it's so full of intrigue and suspense, and I want people to read that for themselves in your book. But I must tell you that I was so impressed with how strategic you were in your search for your birth family. When you were 18, a private investigator advised you to get a job with a private investigation firm so you could acquire the necessary skills. And that's what you did. That was really good advice, wasn't it? Oh, it was excellent advice. And you know, and I carry that on to other people that come to me. You know, when they come to me with the search, I tell them, I, you know, I can't do it. I don't have time. I don't have the bandwidth right now, but you, here's what you hear. You get started and then come back to me, you know, when you need help. And I can't tell you, I don't even remember who he was, but man, if he's out there and he hears this, man, a huge thank you because he's what launched all of this. And he gave me, you know, those breadcrumbs. He gave me that push, that launch into starting to look for my birth family. But I will tell you more than anything that has pushed me in this is of course, you know, God is my, you know, he's been there for me from the very beginning, opening up doors that would not have opened with anything strategic that I did. But I also, I don't like to be told no. And, you know, I learned that very young. Someone tells me, no, I'm just like, yeah, that's not sufficient. You know, I want something that's mine. My birthright is mine. I want to know who my birth family is. I want to know my historical, my medical information. And nobody has that right to take it away from me. No one. And so that has always pushed me. Tell me no. And I'm going to smile and say, okay. And then I'm going to do a workaround. Well, good for you. In 1997, you finally decided to go to the media with your story. What made you decide to do that? So I had been working on trying to find the information for myself and for Michelle. And I had a source that came forward and said, there's more than, you know, there's around 200 plus babies that were from there. And I had thought, I had heard the stories growing up that maybe there was a dozen people in Akron. I had no idea that it was like 200 plus babies that had gone to Akron. So that was what made me go, okay, so I've been doing this search by myself. So if there's 200 people in Akron, maybe if I can get a group of people together, we'll get more, more headway. We'll be able to, to get more information because I had just received, I hadn't received anything specific. I talked with birth mothers. I had stories of the town folk, of Dr. Hicks, of his family and all this information, but nothing specific to either myself or Michelle's birth family. So I thought we'd get a group together. We might be able to get more information. Well, there was a media frenzy about this story, and many Hicks Clinic babies and birth mothers came forward, which led to a DNA registry being created. Obviously, the media was extremely helpful in finding the Hicks Clinic babies and birth families, but I got the sense from your book that you were not entirely happy with the media. Am I right? Yes, it was. Yeah, I was 32 years old, so I had never had any dealings with it. I worked private investigation. So I had no idea how to deal with them. And they were like, for the most part, they were like sharks, you know, in the water. It was, they were trying to make us look like something that we weren't, you know, they were sensationalizing to such a degree. And then, you know, they were attacking Dr. Hicks. And even though it's justified, you know, and he was a colorful character, evil, there were a lot of things he did that were just off the scale, horrible. I still had to keep up, I still, my goal was to find birth mothers. And I didn't want the birth mothers to think that they were a part of something that was shady because he had duped so many people and I didn't want to scare the birth mothers away. So they, the media really didn't, they did not do us any favors because they tried to make him look like such the, it's like a ghost basically. And that anybody connected to him was part and parcel, you know, with, with something illegal and criminal when that wasn't the case. So they weren't listening to me when I was trying to give them the facts and they were, they were trying to shape the story instead of just reporting on it. Well, then let me ask you this, Jane, what impression do you think you conveyed to your readers in your book about Dr. Hicks? Because I got to tell you, I wasn't uh, thinking of nominating him for doctor of the century. I was trying to convey the truth of who he was. You know, I'm not here to judge him. 
I wanted people to know the truth of what he had done and how he had done it, you know, to really make people think about who Dr. Hicks was, you know, but when it all comes down to it, you know, as I talked about in the book, he was just a man, you know, he was allowed to do things and he was just a man. Not one of us is perfect, but yeah, he was pretty, he was pretty evil. I mean, there's, there's absolutely no one can just, no one can dispute that period. Well, this is a man who performed at least one abortion on a woman against her will. And in some cases, he told women that their babies had died and then gave those babies away. Is that not evil? That is evil. That is pure evil. Okay, I now want to ask you about the DNA registry. You made a decision to respect the privacy of the birth mothers and not disclose their identities, even though some Hicks Clinic babies felt they had an absolute right to know the identity of their birth mothers. Tell us why you made that decision. Yeah, again, you know, the women that went through the Hicks Clinic, they, most of them had little choice, you know, so I'm not going to fast forward the clock 30, 40 years and intrude into their lives. They should still have that choice. And the privacy of the birth mothers and the birth fathers to me is more important. And I even, I even take that to my own life. You know, if my birth mother didn't want to meet me or know who I was, I'm okay with that. But I would like to have my medical, my historical information. And that's how I had set up the original, the DNA registry was. So it's like a mirror. So they could give their information. They didn't have to give their specific, their personal information, their contact information, but they could give the information of their background and maybe who the father was, you know, or give their background. And then it would be deposited in that registry. And then someone could just go ahead and we could connect them and they could have their information. I was really impressed in the book, Jane, by the way that you treated the birth mothers. You clearly saw them as victims. Yes, because they were. Even if they went there knowingly giving up a baby to adoption, you know, they weren't treated well. They were put in these small apartments, you know, some of them on the side of the Hicks Clinic and made to you know, wash floors and, you know, sweep up the floor after the local, you know, the local beautician, you know, as she's cutting hair. And I, and I just can't imagine sitting in that apartment pregnant in a place that you know no one, you're not really allowed to go out and do anything. You're kind of, it's just, it was not done nicely. So, I mean, and these are the women that came there and knowingly gave up their babies and then they weren't given any information the birth certificate was changed so they could never find their child again. I mean, a, a person, a woman that goes there at say the age of 16, 18, even if they're in their twenties or thirties, they have a right to know where their child went to. Now, during your investigation, you met a wonderful social worker named Carlin, who introduced you to some of the Hicks Clinic birth mothers. You had this to say about the experience. I wanna quote this to you from your book. It was always an adventure with Carlin and her adventures were embedded with the truth of what love is, a truth that you don't want to wait to the end of your life to find. It was as though God's love for these women and Carlin's as well was redeeming the time lost for me and restoring the lonely years of my search. Jane, that is so moving. Where did you learn to write like that? You're gonna make me cry. <laughs> you know, this book, you know, I sat down to write this book and I really didn't think about what I was going to write. I just sat down and wrote it. There was very little editing because this is, I think my whole life, I've been writing this story in my head and you know, it, this is, this is just who I am. And so if I spoke to you about it and I could sit down and talk to you about Carlin and how wonderful she was, I probably would have said those exact words. You know, my time with her sitting on that front porch in Tennessee, watching the fireflies and drinking sweet tea redeemed me. I mean, absolutely redeemed me in the time that I didn't have. I didn't have a mother that spoke to me. I didn't have that support, but Carlin became that to me. She became my mother and her love that she gave to the birth mothers. I mean, she protected them, but she would go to them 
and she would talk to them and say, would you like to talk with Jane? I mean, she didn't intrude on their life. She respected them no matter what walk of life they came from, no matter whether they were poor, whether they were, they had money, she treated them as the same a hundred percent and watching the way that she worked with them and introduced me into their lives was, it was very nice. It was showing me sisterhood and teaching me what it is to love somebody that you absolutely have, you, you don't know, but you've, but, but you do have a connection to them that's from the day that you were born because they came through the Hicks Clinic. In 2015, you sent your DNA to Ancestry.com and so did your sister, Michelle, who ended up meeting her biological sister. Eventually, you were connected with a number of paternal and maternal relatives, including your brother, Tommy, who passed away very soon after you met. How did these people react to meeting you? I have great relationships on both sides. And on my, my paternal side, I went to, I'm trying to think what it was. It was a couple of years ago, so three years ago now, that they invited me to a family reunion. And they invited me and, and embraced me you know, with open arms. And I talked to them regularly and it's just been wonderful. And then on the maternal side, it, it's been the same. I mean, it's just been, it's been really good really, really good. And now I have people that I look like. And I actually even, I, you know, hear voices at the, at the reunion, I would hear voices. I'm like, that sounds like me. And it's like, this is, this is just one of the coolest things ever. So it's been really good. You didn't get to meet your birth parents, but your birth father's family told you that they were 100% certain that he never knew you existed. And that if he had known, he would never have agreed to giving you away. Does it make it easier knowing that he never actually gave you up? Yes, it does. It really, it was really good to hear them tell me that he would have come and got me. And if he wouldn't have raised me, he would have given me to Grandma Maud Cruz. And she would have raised me because they said, you're, you're a Cruz. You know, there's just no way around that she wouldn't have taken you in and you would have been raised with the rest of us. And so that was really, that was really cool. Really, really good. So when you finally found out the details about your birth parents' lives and personalities, did that help you understand yourself better, Jane? <laughs> yes, it did. You know, when you grow up around a family that you have DNA, you share DNA with, you just take that for granted. You know, but I can tell you over all of my years and helping people search and connecting people in the beginning, when I was younger, I would have told you that it was all about nurture. And I'm going to tell you, I have changed my mind in the last probably 20, 30 years. It is, it's nature, man, that DNA, there's a lot of things that I do that, that is, you know, just like what they're like, oh, well, your father, oh, that's what he liked. What was it? what's your favorite food? Just really small things, you know, and they would, well, what's your favorite food? And I would tell them and they would go, Oh my God, that's what your dad ate all the time, you know? And, you know, there's just a lot of, just a lot of things that shouldn't make, you know, they shouldn't, you shouldn't, you wouldn't think that you've never met someone for 50 years, but you sit down at a, you know, you sit down at a place and you start comparing it and it's almost it's, it's just almost like you lived with them your whole life and pick that stuff up. So it's the short, the short is, is that I feel like it's nature over nurture 99% of the time. In 2019, the TLC television network did a three-part documentary series called Taken at Birth about the Hicks Clinic mothers and babies. And it was very thorough. It dealt with the abortions, the induced labors and premature births to meet doctors, schedule, the stolen babies from mothers who were told their babies had died, the adults looking for the families they were stolen from, and of course, the secrets kept by the people who worked at the clinic. What did you think of the docu-series? I thought that it represented it well. And I think that, you know, the, the, the crew, the producers, the showrunner, they really wanted to capture the truth of the story. And so I was very, it was a great experience working with them. And, you know, TLC 
they took their time in getting this story out. And I was so grateful that they did because they didn't just do a real quick synopsis. They were able to delve into the story. They gave their production company the space and the time that they needed to, to get the story out there because this isn't a, this is a very intricate story. You know, Dr. Hicks was looked at by a lot of the townspeople that didn't know what was going on behind the walls of the Hicks Clinic. They looked at him as being an angel, as someone that helped them out. And the people that knew what happened, they knew that he was no angel. So there was just so many details about his life and the people that he touched, good and bad, that really needed to be represented. So I was very happy with that docuseries. I want to read you something you wrote in the book about the docuseries. You said, unloading 20 plus years of assessing what had been done and how it could have been different if I had made other decisions with my search was freeing. The docuseries brought an opportunity to mend some fences and embrace new perspectives on the past. Jane, what fences needed to be mended and what new perspectives did you acquire? You know, if I had wrote, written the book 20 years earlier, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be as forgiving because, you know, I had my moments with Dr. Hicks, you know, and what he had done, kind of what he had set me up for, which, you know, was a difficult childhood. Town folks, you know, a lot of things have changed since 1997 because they weren't embracing in 1997 when that story hit because they took it as a an affront to them, which is not what it was meant. And that, you know, is part of the problem I had with the media. So in those two aspects, I was able to come to terms and understand them better. You know, I'm the type of person that, you know, I run in and try to get stuff done. And then later I think about it and go, wait a minute, maybe I shouldn't have done that. You know, and there were quite a few times that I did that on my search, you know, running in and, hey, you know, what's this? And give me this information and could have been done a little more delicately. And so that's mostly what I refer to there. Well, you wrote in the book that you don't judge Dr. Hicks anymore. That kind of floored me. Why not? Because he's just a, he was just a man. He was allowed to do what he did. I mean, I, you run across people like this every day. They do what, they're, what they can get away with. He was just a man. I've made so many mistakes in my life. I've hurt people. I've never done it to the extent that he has. But, you know, I, I serve a God that says, you don't judge people. That's for him to judge. And that's where I lay my judgment is at the feet of, of God, because that's not mine to take up. Now, is there justice? If Dr. Hicks were alive today, or if I had been alive back in that time, I would have brought him to justice and had no problem with it. But I, as a person, am not going to judge him because I've done things myself that I'm not proud of. And I think everybody can, I think everybody can relate to that. You're a remarkably forgiving person. Have you come to terms with the fact that you never did meet your birth parents? Are you at peace with that now? Yes. You know, it's, man, I, I would have loved to have danced with Herbert, you know, with my birth father. I would have loved to have danced with him. There's a lot of things that I wish that I could do, but I'm all right. You know, I set out on this search to find who I was. And I think that that's more important. You know, I talk about, you know, where home is, you know, home is finding where you, where you belong more than the DNA. And I feel like that I have found that anything else beyond that is just bonus. And uh, that's, I think that's the goal of every search is to have peace and to understand that there's hope while you're searching, but then to find peace and to find home. Well, Jane, I want to thank you so much for having the courage and the tenacity to search for the truth and to let us all share in the lessons that your search taught you. I'm so honored and grateful that you came on our show to tell your story and to talk about your amazing book. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. And thank you for asking such great questions and talking about 
talking about life with me. Thank you. Our guest has been Jane Blasio, author of Taken at Birth, Stolen Babies, Hidden Lies, and My Journey to Finding Home. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.